colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Has anybody heard voices recently? Hands up, please. Oh, there you are. You have heard voices in that. <coughs> so you may qualify to be noble. Uh, the first recorded uh, hero of voice was, of course, Moses. This was uh, 1300 BC, <clears throat> and uh, God dictated the Ten Commandments, as well as various other things to him. <clears throat> and <clears throat> much of <clears throat> uh, in what is written in the Old Testament also comes from some of these statements. So recently, an Israel, Israeli university professor uh, wrote a paper about Moses, right? Uh, of course, you know that Moses is Jew, uh, all the prophet of prophet for Jews, and this is Israel. So he wrote a paper saying that Moses must have been hallucinating, that he was walking through the desert and he was, would have been hungry and must have eaten these uh, hallucinogenic substances, uh, plants. So in any other country, of course, he would have been roasted, but he wasn't. Israel is a democratic country. You can say anything you like. Then, of course, we know Buddha's uh, conversations with Mara, for example, clear hallucinations, both visual and auditory. Then Jesus was fasting for 40 days. And uh, it's very similar. They're, like uh, in the case of Buddha, the Mara came to uh, persuade him to uh, eat. Uh, asked him to turn the stone into bread, right? And uh, of course, Jesus refused, right? Um, just like Buddha, right? Uh, that's why they were noble, I suppose. Muhammad went through the same experience. Uh, Gabriel, of course, spoke to him and dictated uh, more, much of what is known in Islam, Islam today. Um, Quran, for example, was dictated to him from time to time by Gabriel the angel. Then, of course, Socrates heard voices, and this is one of the faults that uh, he had, because Socrates said, when I want to stop doing something, my, uh, my voice tells me this. Then, of course, Gandhi has owned up, and, of course, famous Nash, he, of course, heard voices very much later. So, basically, it is not uh, necessarily a bad thing to hear voices like some of you here heard voices, right? It's not a bad thing. Where, and that is not, they, none of them are schizophrenic, right? But may, they may have been illiterate, because literacy was not there in Moses' time, not in Buddha's time. Jesus, of course, there was literacy, uh, but there's no evidence that Jesus was literate. So, and extreme hunger, stress, could have precipitated this, uh, uh, hallucinations. So this is a statement by uh, uh, this uh, well-known religious scholar who maintains that voices experienced can be the kind of religious block, building block for many religions, right? So it's nothing unusual. Then we came to the medieval period and during the medieval period, they had Chaucer, who wrote uh, many stories where people were hearing voices. Uh, then, like the bereaved husband who heard the voice of uh, his uh, dead wife. And then there were various saints who had conversations with uh, God, right? So it's, it was not a common, uncommon thing at all during the medieval period. It became abnormal when a squirrel described hallucinations 200 years ago as abnormal. Not until then. So we are su it's surprising, isn't it? Right? No, they, they were normal, and they were often noble, rather than normal. So, and you can see this, right? For example, in uh, uh, Bethlehem Hospital, right? The, now the hospital that is attached to uh, Mortsley, there, 
the notes do not indicate that they made a distinction between hallucinations and delusions. So there is this, uh, at that time, because be, uh, this famous Bucknell and Tuke, you must be familiar with the term Tuke, right? They wrote an editorial uh, in the, I think it's called Mental Asylum Journal, Journal of Asylum, that uh, pleading with the doctors to separate these things, you know, don't, don't put them together, right? Delusions are not hallucinations, right? They, like we do with trainees, isn't it? Right. Um, so it is, it was not universal, no, right? So this is now, from the time of Esquirel, it was building up in psychiatry, that hallucinations are very important, hearing voices important. Then, of course, came crippling. And the German psychiatrists, being German, they were wanted to be very precise. So when they became very precise, I mean, even the Brits are not so precise, but when the Germans tried to be very precise, they said, no, no, hallucinations are hallucinations, delusions are delusions, and if there are hallucinations, that is a sign of schizophrenia. So that's how we came to the present day dilemma of the hallucinations being schizophrenia. So, as you know, then came Snyder, who described different types of hallucinations, and then said, if these are there, that is schizophrenia, pathognomic of schizophrenia. I mean, we know all this, right? So, they, I'm just going to describe to you two young women. One was a 19-year-old girl who has been um, who has been depressed for, for three months. She was also hearing the voices of her friends saying that things had bad things about her. They even discussed about her sexuality. No suicidal tendencies. Another one was very similar, 21-year-old university student who was hearing voices one month. The voices were accusatory in nature, but not in third person. She also had quite um, lower mood. She was she qualified to be depressed. Qualified. Now, I slightly went outside guidelines. I actually treated them both with fluoxetine only. I really should have used uh, an antipsychotic in small doses, but I didn't. I because this they they looked sounded so similar. So I, I will tell you what happened to them later. <clears throat> so in the adult population. If you just disregard the psychotic patients, how common is it? They, there's only one cross-national study, um, uh, which I think which of 52 countries, as you can see. What they found was that something like 5.8% of the population had hallucinations, of course. Not necessarily voices, but hallucinations. That included both visual and uh, auditory hallucinations. Right. They, then, UK study, that's a well-known uh, study of, uh, I think it's, I forget the name of it, it's called uh, uh, Household Study of uh, s s s s s Mental Disorder, something like that, right? That's a very carefully done study, st uh, reported 4.2% of the normal population were hallucinating, right? So this is clearly now coming back to the psychiatrists. What is happening? Because they are no schizophrenic, no are they psychotic in any way, but they are hallucinating. They have hallucinations. So maybe they, they were just hallucinating for a day or two, and then that is over. Maybe they had a drink and they were hallucinating. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so before that, we will look at the children. In the case of children, it's something like 17%, which is quite high, actually, if you think about it. Um, and uh, the so it seems to be around 17%, and then when they reach adolescence, it seems to drop to about 7 to 8%, and then it just keeps dropping off. That seems to be the pattern. So this is a very interesting pay review. I recommend that we all, you all read this, because uh, this appeared in uh, Schizophrenia Bulletin, and uh, an Australian study from Perth, they looked at, they, I mean, they reviewed large number of papers, large number of studies, right? And uh, they just compared uh, the various uh, 
characteristics of voices in normal people, in depressed patients, and uh, of course they didn't include schizophrenia because it's, everybody knows this. So, and they also used uh, they they also used categories such as uh, uh, dissociative identity disorder, which is very much an American uh, diagnosis. But I strongly feel that some of many of our uh, many of our people who uh, who dissociate uh, and give recipes for uh, panniers, for example, you know, they probably have the dissociative uh, identity disorder, right? They, which which is a subject for some of these uh, young people to study in the future. So what you find is that. Voices, when compared for persistence, vividness, and reality, affective disorder certainly high, 77%. Dissociative disorder, it's higher, it's 93%. And in the normal population, it is 47%. So clearly, we can't make a distinction based on the vividness, reality, or persistence. And let's go to the next one. Voices compared arising from external space, existing in the external space. Bipolar disorder, 83 percent. Dissociative identity disorder, 67 percent. And normal patients, normal, so not patients, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Normal population, we are looking at 57 percent. So that's, you know, these are not inner voices, they experience it from outside. And so that clearly is not going to distinguish. Voices compared in third person, voices in third person, which was, which we all for a long time accepted as uh, pathognomonic or schizophrenia. Here we have affective disorder is 40% and alcohol withdrawal something like, is 25 to 60, whereas normal population, again, high, 20%. So, that doesn't seem to hold water too. Let's look at the other one. Voices commenting. Voices commenting, effective 54, then uh, dissociative identity disorder, how much higher, 80%, normal 41%. So does it help to us to distinguish between these disorders? No, it doesn't. Right. So we are facing a problem now. <clears throat> Voices with negative content, the 58%, and alcohol withdrawal, of course, almost all, and normal, less than half, right? So that doesn't help us to uh, make, make a distinction, too. Attribution of voices to family members, so there seems to be a difference here. In normal people, more normal people seem to attribute their voices to family members, deceased members of the religious uh, or religious figures. Whereas psychosis, they attribute it to supernatural or to those within delusions. Whatever delusions exist, they are the ones who talk to them. <clears throat> then, uh, what are the other features of normal hallucinations? Not interfering with daily lives, that's a key feature. They say, so what, nothing more, I mean, a couple of days ago, I saw a patient who said, I hear voices, but it, it is, it is uh, it's fine. I have been hearing it from my childhood, right? And uh, she came to me for something else because she was suicidal of things of late. Sadness, stress, and tiredness could precipitate, maybe the, like the noble hallucinations, able to control and less distressful, usually not commanding, may last for months or years, and the mean age of onset seems to be for 12.4 years for the normal hallucinations, whereas it's 21.4 for schizophrenia. So that seems to be the only difference that we notice. So if, you, someone, if someone says, you're hearing voices, I'm hearing voices from my school days, you're probably not dealing with schizophrenia. So the next question that is worth asking is, so okay, there are you are normal. There are normal people who hear voices, but are they all normal? Really normal? So this question was uh, looked at again in this U UK study. 
Um, they reported, uh, as you said, 4.24% of the population. Then uh, what they saw was that there was a trend in decrease in the mental disorder in these people. But three to five odds ratio for suicide attempts and suicide, at least one mental disorder, commonly depression or, or anxiety. So individuals who experience voices are at a higher risk of psychosis. That is another finding from somebody else if they also develop depression. So what do we, what do we see now here? We have a continuum of voices from childhood, and if they become depressed or if, if they do, the voices change, but they persist, right? But if they don't develop anything, the trend seems to be for these hallucinations to drop off. The voices drop, right? And so by the time they are in their over 60, it's less than 4% will have hallucinations. So that seems to be the trend. So this is a very interesting area for many of the trainings to work in, because that so what we thought was suddenly a sudden onset of hallucinations doesn't seem to be the case, right? Except in very severe schizophrenia, I suppose. Yeah, so this is uh, a question that, that is being explored by a large group of uh, researchers at uh, King's College, uh, London, and they, they have found, they have some more findings, which confuse us even more. That is, they found no differences in the brain images of psychotic and normal voice hearers. That is, when you put them under the scan, whether it's a schizophrenic hear, uh, voice hearer or a normal hearer, the areas that are affected are the same. Then, no difference in the prevalence of abuse in childhood, because it's well known that abuse in childhood predisposes to hearing voices later. But here, with psychotic and normal, there's no difference. So it, it seems as if, because I, I think it's too early for us to pronounce this, but it seems as if hearing is a thing that starts in childhood, in children who have been abused, but this seems to be to even affect or cause depression and other Ill 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 illnesses later, or that they get aggravated with when the, with the onset of certain disorders. So what does it imply? Well, what are the implications for psychiatry? Implications are huge, I think. They, if you look at, uh, because even DSM-5 hasn't uh, taken this into consideration. DSM-5 for brief psychotic disorder, if a person has hearing of voices for more than 24 hours, that you can diagnose uh, brief psychotic disorder. That's a problem, isn't it? Right? So, and the problem with clinicians is that treat, we treat symptoms. I mean, there's very clear evidence for that. There's a very good paper for those who want to uh, read this. Um, so, that's a dangerous, creating a dangerous trend. Then, early intervention programs in the NHS allows a score of four or higher in the positive scale of PAT of this uh, PN PNS S2, love entry. If you hear voices, you can get up to seven points. So the NHS guidelines, we have problems, <laughs> right? So if you follow NHS guidelines, uh, right you can put 17% children into early intervention programs. That's where the problems are, right? Then they, and, and of course, we don't need to, the, the, the simple truth is that we don't need to keep increasing antipsychotics or engage in polypharmacy just because a person, j just to suppress voices. We may never do that. We know that most of our patients don't really stop hearing voices, but they say, it's okay now, I can live with that. Very common treatment. So we don't need to keep increasing and, uh, and pummel them with all this medication. Coming back to those two women, woman number uh, A, she turned out to be just straightforward depression, and she responded to fluoxetine alone, nothing else. 
Six months later, she was fine. Woman B, as we went, she gathered more and more hallucinations, and she became more and more psychotic. And within two weeks, I had to stop my fluoxetine and start on proper medication. Right. So that's where we are right now. Right. So hallucinations alone won't lead to a diagnosis. So my final word, don't run away with voices. I, we sometimes see this uh, in, sub, in doctor's notes, hearing voices, schizophrenia. Don't run away with them. And investigate, analyze, be critical of what you're doing. And they, they may be normal or depressed or may even be noble. Right? Who knows, we may be producing another Jesus in this country. Right. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, interesting and stimulating lecture. Um, because we have a little time remaining, I may allow uh, one or two questions. Uh, I'm sure there's so many questions that may arise. Is uh, a lot of people they talk to say? Yeah. Mm. Here in Voices business and talking to say. I don't know. I mean, we, we sort of assume that uh, we assume that uh, people who are talking to self, they are they are hearing voices. But I must say, tell you, when when I was a young. Uh, inexperienced psychiatrist. I remember I, I treated the plant because he was talking to himself. And the reason why he was brought to me was because his wife was embarrassed, right? And so I was really treating wife's wish, right? And he never, I mean, he never stopped talking to himself. So he used to keep asking me, doctor, why are you treating me? Right, I'm okay. And now I, I feel so embarrassed to, even when I think about it, what I did. So I, so, no, talking to self is, as you say, it's quite normal as hearing voices. Recently, a 17-year-old girl was brought to me saying that she was here. I said, that's fine, let her talk to herself. She's doing exams, and she's passing exams. She, she's doing sports. That's fine, let her talk to herself. And that's the, that's the lesson I learned from my early days. Yes, religious so leaders. Lord Buddha, Jesus, you said they had brief episodes of voices. They were really psychotic episodes? <laughs> no, I mean... Oh, they are normal people with normal brain, neuro -analogy. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this evidence, it's clear that they were, there was no psychosis at all. That they were... Uh, I mean, it is... It is this, now I am, I, am, I, am, I am just putting forward a conjecture. That is, it may be that it... The hearing of voices may have been more in the days when the land, they went there, where language was not written or, or, or written or read, right? So it may have been more those days. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, thinking outside the box rather than, okay, when you hear voices, diagnose and treat. And actually this is not only creating the controversy, this creates a lot of can of worms. What to do when somebody in front of you saying that you hear voices, whether to wait or whether to treat or whether to diagnose? Uh, I would like to know what it is because we are stuck and we are more confused now yeah. in that sense. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the standard criteria are laid down, say, in DSM-5. I mean, I, I see the 11 is not still here, here yet because I, I, the DSM-5 says, I think, two of the following, right? And of course, there has to be a level of dysfunction. So, I, so if a person has no dysfunction, the person is quite normal in life, then, and it's only the, only the voices that the person has, then there's no reason to treat such a person, treat, diagnose or treat such a person. And of course, if it is in relation to a mood disorder, that is quite prevalent, or a dysfunction, and if the voices are quite dysfunctional, then it's a different, different story. And 
I don't know what I would have to say if the patient says, please treat me anyway. Because do you put them on an antipsychotic and disable them? Or I don't know. It's, it's something for us to think about. So that makes psychiatry a very difficult subject to practice. Dr. Amila and Dr. Usha. Thank you. You're talking to yourself. Yeah. Is one. I'm talking about responding to your know, talking. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Isn't that, that, isn't that, that most I mean, in, in that case, that would be dysfunctional, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Because that will be dysfunctional. Then it becomes a disorder. Yeah, that, because that, that will be fine. Because, say, you're, you're abusing somebody, you know, and, uh, you know, you don't function, I mean, you can't function normally. Then, then that will be a disorder, yeah. Dr. Okay. Amila, one last question from you, yes. and we'll… And uh, so, if these uh, voices settle on their own, so th I think there, there should be a serious implication on early intervention studies in Australia and UK. So, when we consider the outcome, so if, they, if those voices and psychotic symptoms, not psychotic symptoms, voices settle on their own, so, I'm sure there will be serious implications and uh, questions on early intervention studies comparing medications and other interventions. Yes, you're quite right, Amila, because, I mean, they, there are serious implications. How do you get hold of a 13-year-old, 14-year-old who just hears a voice now and then, and then uh, put him in a psychiatric treatment program? Because I, that has always bothered me for a long time. And what... Recently, there was, a, there was a discussion on Zoom with a, with a doctor who was practicing early intervention, with the trainees here, remember? And one of the trainees asked the question, sir, what do you do with this baby? Do you treat them with antipsychotics? I said, oh, no, 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 no. We use uh, CBT first, right? You know, when you mention CBT, Nowadays, it's a sort of quarter Thailand, you know, <laughs> right? And then, then, of course, he was quite honest and said many of them turned out to be either depressed or no, no psychotic disorder. So, so it's something we have to be extremely careful, as you say, yeah. That I think we will increasingly come across these patients here because uh, it is becoming slightly less stigmatic for, there's less stigma for going to psychiatrists now. So. I mean, so we will increasingly see, particularly young people coming with voices, hearing voices, and be extremely careful. <laughs> I think, madam, we will have to stop at this point because we have things going on, and I'm sure this can go on. <laughs> like one last chance. Do you diagnose this on one symptom? No, no. no. So, so that's what I was saying all the time. And basically, <laughs> that, that uh, but what I said is not diagnosed, but doctors tend to treat symptom wise. I mean, this is a very good study that they, they have quoted. And that is a pretty dangerous situation when you are dealing with just one symptom. One, 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 one